Um, we are presenting today this session with our great friends from the Greater Vancouver Professional Theatre Alliance, aka GBPTA, uh, with whom we've partnered on a number of events to support the uh, theatre sector and uh, the PUSH Festival, um, who are presently in the midst of a festival. So, yay. Uh, without further ado, um, I want to share a couple of slides. The first slide is from very early in the pandemic. We're going to see if this works. Joanna, I I'm just going to um, leave uh, Joanna and Derek and Stephanie to introduce themselves when we get to that point. And I just want to, but I'm going to put the conversation in a bit of context with uh, the next slide, which has this rather interesting provision in it. This was very early on and um, like, and it might surprise some of you to know that not everybody gets legal advice when they draft up additions to their contracts that are different from the standards they've always used. So this was a provision two provisions, the presenter shall receive a 5% royalty on the artist fee if the artist agrees to the presentation of the work other than for archival purposes. Now, historically, um, you know, artists would retain work for allow a presenter to perhaps document for archival purposes, but they didn't actually uh, generate royalties out of it. And I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I think that the idea behind this provision was that they would add a royalty in um, in the event that they were able to stream the show that was going up and, um, and uh, generate some revenue from it. Uh, then um, the next provision being the pre presenter will not agree to the presentation of the digital work without the express permission of the artist. So that's good, right? Uh, you absolutely should make sure that uh, any provisions that you've agreed to um, allow for that where there are going to be digital streams. So, for example, I went to see Born to Manifest, and there is a streaming option of Born to Manifest only for the select period. And um, presumably um, their contract uh, indicated what the payment would be and how they would manage the stream. Um, the real issue when, when I saw this provision was, was a, I was asked how to deal with it. Um, and I made some, a series of recommended changes, um, most notably that, um, you know, you would not allow a presenter or anyone actually to uh, create a digital stream and then use it without not only your permission as an artist, but also without having vetted it and approved of it. Um, and what happened after that is that um, a number of um, presenters and festivals actually went to artists and asked them to pre-record uh, their shows so that they were in effect buying a, a, a presentation for a select period of time that they would run on, on whatever basis. And at least there where I'd arguably, of course, the artists are now on the hook for all the fees, the the other thing, the good part about it was was that they had artistic control, and if you tuned into our pivoting to digital music edition, you'll remember that um, among the issues that musicians raised was uh, having to perform shows uh, without either stipulating in advance that they, how they were going to be remunerated and that they actually needed to have good sound and have control over the ultimate product because they didn't want their crap. They didn't want less than ideal stuff, not crap, going out. So I've kind of set the stage for what our conversation today, and I'm going to turn the stage over to uh, Joanna Garfinkel, 
um, who many of you may know uh, as a theater artist and dramaturg in, here in uh, the Lower Mainland and um, with whom I've been on a couple of panels now, I think, um, talking about rights and not rights and wrongs. So over to you, Joanna. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am Joanna Garfinkel. I am also an unceded and stolen Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh land. Uh, I'm the dramaturg for creative engagement at PTC, Playwrights Theatre Centre, and I am also uh, an independent theatre maker. And when we first started having this conversation about pivoting to digital, I brought an example to the people you see on this panel um, uh, of something that had happened about six months ago. So now we're uh, at season two or three of the pandemic, whatever which one we're on. Um, and uh, it was an example, I, I, I brought this example not to call out the company, but more to show some of the problems that we have. Um, so maybe Martha, uh, Nelson can help with the slide of an example. There was a call out on Facebook as we all, so many artists are looking uh, to share their work and uh, a company, a theater company in Toronto put out a call for applications and people often don't read, myself very much included, the fine print. Uh, I do not have a law degree. I have an MFA. <laughs> um, so uh, I I share this example because people started to realize uh, and some co colleagues in, in our sector started to call out that by even just submitting a proposal that you were granting in perpetuity um, license to do anything, literally anything with one's work. And um, perhaps in the chat or in the Q&A, um, some people might have had experience with this and I might then take this opportunity to swing it to my lovely colleagues, uh, Derek and Stephanie, to introduce themselves and to speak about uh, some of, uh, or perhaps what happened next. Sure thing. Um, hi, my name is Stephanie Wong. I use she, her pronouns, and I am also beaming on to you on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh peoples. I am the artistic associate and director of productions at Renaissance Opera. Um, was it just intros? Should I pass it to Derek now? Is that, or I will pass it to Derek to introduce. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, my name is Derek Chan. Uh, my name in Cantonese is Chan Gao. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, like Joanna, Martha, and Stephanie, I'm also on stolen, unceded, and ancestral lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, uh, today, I'm I'm joining this panel as managing artistic director of Vancouver Asian Canadian Theater. Uh, I'm also coming in as a freelance theater maker, and also uh, formerly co-artistic director of Rice and Beans Theater with Pedro Chamale. Um, yeah, Joanna, uh, is there anything that uh, you would like us to start with? Um, sure. Uh, so I thought we could start with, and I had seeded up with an example, but I think that there are others. Um, what are the challenges of being treated fairly when it comes to making digital work? Um, and that could include being paid fairly, determining use, or the scope of digital presentation. Uh, my my first thought uh, when it comes to the main challenge, uh, it came from the early, early days of the pandemic. And and it really wasn't anybody's fault, like truly, truly. I'm not just being nice. Uh, if it is, I would say so. It really wasn't somebody anybody's fault. Um, it was early days and we were making a digital piece. It was a collaboration between a few artists, um, artists that I really enjoy working with. And what happened was that as a freelance artist, uh, we collectively underestimated how much time it took for, for post-production, so to speak, because it's a digital thing and, and we were largely live performance artists. And that added to a lot of um, uh, 
of our stress towards the end to meet the the show date, so to speak. Um, and the the other one was that um, uh, this is throughout throughout the pandemic, my experience as a freelancer doing digital work. Sometimes it wasn't entirely sure what support the presenter or producer provides to the individual artist. Um, uh, say, if they're engaging a writer uh, like myself, would they be providing support on equipment to make this thing a digital thing, or would they provide consultation, or uh, what kind of what kind of team do I have to come in with, and uh, or what kind of team do they come in with? And also, ultimately, who is who is funding all these people's work and and time and experience? Um, there are a few more things, but uh, yeah, Stephanie, what about you? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I should also mention that I do work as a freelance artist as well, so I have both company perspective, but also individual artist perspective, trying to navigate this new world. Um, and I can speak to the beginning of the pandemic as a freelance artist. Yeah, I think there were so many great initiatives of a lot of companies and a lot of institutions being like, hey, we want to support you theater artists right off the bat. Here's a little chunk of change, make something, which is really great. But then following that, it's okay, then who owns that property? Who, like, was it the creator? Is it the institution that commissioned it with that small budget? Um, and also how does that then get distributed? Does it live online forever now, that little piece of work? Um, it's something that I don't think we've had to encounter. And a lot of companies are now trying to figure out very quickly how to do this equitably, how to treat artists fairly, who owns creative or intellectual property, because that's something I think that in the digital sphere, it's a whole new world. Um, yeah, and I think other challenges that have come up is the fact that we are working in a very saturated market. Um, and a lot of us come from grant funding. We're not used, we don't have, we just simply do not have big film budgets to do the same thing that film studios do. But the distribution is a lot broader, a lot larger, and we're having to make things at comparable qualities. It's tough to be able to create at that scope when we don't have the money to do so. And then who's being cost in that is generally artists with equitable pay. So it's challenging to navigate that. Yeah. And, and adding to that just a little bit, um, coming from the producer side, uh, side of things, uh, contracting. I know, I know different, different regulating bodies and, and associations and unions have uh, uh, kind of talked about this and, and tried to meet our needs over the years, but but often I still find, at least for myself still, um, uh, there's still a confusion sometimes, especially if it's a hybrid performance. If there's live elements to go with the digital element, how do we contract this? And and uh, of course it's a little it's a little easier if if the um, if our collaborators aren't members of those of those associations or unions and then as producers, um, you know, then we need to pay them properly, uh, uh, pay them as people. Uh, but but then it it it, it gets gets tricky. I still find uh, when when it's a mixed media uh, or, or cross discipline performances, and and even then, a lot of those um, minimum suggested or regulated fees are very not livable. Um, and and um, I find that hard to navigate because, like Stephanie, you said, funding is limited, and and how do we pay people properly while still have resources to output, uh, um, uh, so to speak, a product that is aesthetically satisfying but also um, uh, fiscally responsible? That's a great point, Derek. I think. Um... I think that there's the perception that a lot of us have uh, union um, protection, uh, like, you know, for example, the actors with equity, but um, a lot of us, and perhaps the two of you can speak to this as well, um, are maybe unrepresented. Uh, not, artists are often freelance. Um, if you are an independent creator, there is no such thing as a playwrights union. We have a guild, which is 
uh, very different. Dramaturgs have uh, even uh, an association. Um, and so maybe we could, we could sweep to what are some of the challenges of non-unionized arts workers and, and, and how can, so Martha put back the, this call and we have, um, I wonder if we, how do we handle negotiation if we are not represented by a union or a manager or a company and we're presented with some uh, terms that Martha Rands, I'm sure will be able to tell us exactly how unfair they are. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that gets to the nub of the issue. The reason why I was very struck when I saw the first provision, um, and it was an established presenter, um, I was like, you're seriously going to just expect people to just agree to a royalty without any consideration for the broader view of what it is that you're proposing they do um, by enabling a digital stream at all. Um, and you reminded me, Derek, when you were speaking of, you know, the National Theatre, um, which many of us enjoyed uh, in 2020 because they're, they put stuff up for free, um, has millions of dollars committed and a separate department specifically for the um, filming, because it is a film they are making, of the th theatrical production. And same with the Met and the large um, creative companies uh, all over Europe. Uh, and they've been doing this for a while. This is not actually new. Um, but And the idea that you would simply sort of give to an artist, oh, here's a few shekels. Why don't you, you know, um, do something? It's great. It's better than nothing, I suppose. But then there are all those questions. And I think what, what is so shocking to me about this provision um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is boilerplate language that is straight out of probably a film background or film contract. Um, and anytime you see that kind of language in a, in a contract, you're probably dealing with people who may not have actually given it a whole lot of thought. Because in 90% of the circumstances, you're going to want to negotiate all these issues. Now, in this case, the good part is that you retain ownership, but you appear to be granting in perpetuity, which means forever, a worldwide, which means everywhere, non-exclusive, which means I suppose you can do something else with the material, but you've given them the right to do this all over the place, royalty free, so without any royalties, and they can sub license it and transfer it uh, to use, reproduce, modify, edit, distribute, prepare derivative works of, which means that, oh, I really liked um, Rice and Beans Agricultural Odyssey. I think I want to start, I want to make an animated version of um, the, the farmers in the fields, uh, that's a derivative work. So we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and do that. I hope you don't mind. Um, we, got a, we got a grant from the Ministry of Agriculture, um, you know, should they be so lucky. Um, display, adapt, so an adaptation, reformat, translate. So in other words, you could translate um, it into any language you choose uh, and otherwise exploit and perform any or all portion of the submission proposal for any purpose whatsoever. S -s 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 what? Sorry, that's pretty broad. Um, and why would they even want this, right? Um, the difficulty, I mean, you know, you could sign this and not worry about it because the theater company, well, you know, it's a one-off, you know, no big deal. The problem that will arise ultimately is going to be if, let's say, you were lucky enough to get an opportunity for this to be broadcast or to go, go much larger than you maybe initially imagined it. And 
you'll have to clear all of these rights in order to be able to sign an agreement with a broadcaster or with another entity. They're gonna want exclusivity and you've given this, um, uh, you've enabled this to already happen. Um, so this is really problematic language. And then it gets even worse, which these things do. Um, and this is the sign that it's probably coming from the film world. You hereby waive all moral rights in and to such submission in favor of the company and anyone author authorized by the company to use the submission. So you're not only walking away from the copyright and any power you might have to, uh, to, to this work, um, though it is a non-exclusive license, so you still have some rights, but you waive the moral rights. And I always ask organize anyone that has a moral rights provision, what it means is it enables um, a producer to basically own the thing lock, stock and barrel, and you really can never do anything to change that. So they can insert your music into anything they want. They can take the short film and do whatever they want with it. It's, um, and, you know, they could sell it to the uh, People's Party of Canada for use in the trucker convoy if they so chose. All the things that maybe some artists would be sensitive to. Um, but by waiving your moral rights, you have waived any opportunity to prevent the use of the work by the People's Party of Canada, should you wish to do that. And I always ask, why bother? Like, it, it's an acronym, it doesn't belong in most contracts. And even these days in film, um, where the distribution models have changed dramatically, we're seeing shorter windows, we're seeing reversion rights, we're seeing the rights returning to artists. Um, so I think it's really important just to be alive to that. Uh, all that kind of language. And fortunately, when this went out um, on the interwebs, I understand from my conversation with Joanna that the company realized that it had made a mistake um, because in effect, somebody probably got some lawyer to give them some stock language without really considering it because it's not in the interests of the community to have language like this floating around. So maybe my question to Derek and Stephanie and also to the our colleagues in the chat is um, what is the what are the situations around negotiations, especially when it comes to suddenly um, looking at contracts and agreements that are different than we've ever had to face before? Um, I'm, it, it is, it, as an, as an artist, um, it is definitely overwhelming. Uh, it is, uh, uh, luckily, luckily, um, in my own experience, uh, eventually by now, uh, I feel more comfortable negotiating or asking for clarifications, but that comes with, um, all sorts of privileges that I live with currently. Uh, uh, there are peers of mine, there are colleagues of mine, there are even mentors of mine that, that still don't feel comfortable doing those kind of negotiations, um, uh, especially if, if the contract is offered from somebody that's perceived to, to have more resources, to, to be more prestigious, whatever that means to, to us. And, and um, so on the other side, as, as a, um, uh, somebody in a leadership position in a company, then I think it is very important for for us producers and presenters to 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 read our own fine print. And and like Martha said, does this need to be there and why? Like looking at it now, as an artist, like dramaturgically almost, why does it need to be there? What is the point of this? And 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 um and and for me at least, a practice that that I bring into my work is. 
always um, uh, make it very clear that uh, clarifying or questions or negotiations are always welcome. And we're entering into this negotiation in good faith and we mean it um, and, and we're not holding out on you as a company. And, and um, we're, we're, we will be as transparent as we can with, with our policies and budgets and everything. Um, and, and it's usually pretty transparent um, in, in my practice. But. That's excellent, Derek. And maybe that's one of our, those of us who aren't part of a union or something or have a lawyer on our on retainer um maybe one of the practices that we can also share is sharing examples of contracts with each other and and come a, a lot of times agreements and money in our sector is um yes uh, it, and jiv thank you um sharing uh, some examples from rumble i know um our only power is being an informal union um, and sharing resources like that and not keeping um, uh, contracts and negotiations uh, so secretive. I appreciate that. Um, perhaps Stephanie, uh, I see. Yeah. We'll switch it to you. Yeah, no, I think that was really, um, really great about um, that knowledge sharing component, being in a community that is smaller and we're all learning together and we are all moving with this changing time um having these resources and sharing with one another so that we can learn to do better by as collectives as companies and as artists and i think it's that transparency piece that will allow us to have more freedom in negotiations or in approaching these conversations that have always felt awkward money talks always feel awkward and that's often because of power dynamics in the room but that shouldn't have to be the case because I think it's really about valuing people and their work and their time and their contributions, um, not just as a present thing in the work, but how that might last moving forward because digital has a bit more permanence than theater, which I love the impermanence about theater and the ephemeral part of that, but that's not what we're working with in the digital realm as much. Um, I can speak to kind of Renaissance in, we're very similar in the way that we try to lead with we are open to negotiations this is where we're at but we value you more so than what like we want to hear from you we want to have that conversation and that dialogue with you we try to lead with that so that it's noted that we're trying to dispel that awkwardness and we know that money is weird but we don't want that to have to be the case if it feels like that is costing somebody the ability to work in a dignified way in a way that helps them make a livable wage. We want people to feel valued and yeah. So I think transparency is a really key word in that. And like one, one little thing, hearing you, Stephanie, and, and that really reminds me of, um, uh, this is not, not very like legal focus, so I'm just gonna be quick, but I would hope that we're, you know, we're all here wanting to do the same thing to make art. So um, it's easy to go me versus you in in, in a negotiation point of view. But but uh, yeah, that, I think that's related to uh, transparency, like you said, Stephanie. Um, I'm also going to uh, expand this from just uh, the conversation around uh, contracts and negotiations for our um, pieces, but a thing that. I observed a lot um, beginning in the pandemic was artists having their image or past works uh, resurrected by companies, perhaps in an attempt to fill some space when live work couldn't happen, but also perhaps in, a, in an attempt to, to make their company seem more diverse in a time when uh, they were panicking, um, perhaps other choices that they were making that I, I won't, uh, dare to explore what was behind them. But um, I would like to ask if anybody's uh, name or image or work was used uh, without their permission. Um, I can speak to a, an experience that I had around um, a reading in the pandemic. Um, it, I was part of a reading and um, the company found a picture of me on Facebook and sent me an email saying, hey, can we use this for marketing the event, which I assumed was like everyone's headshots were being used for the event. So I said, sure, but please use my professional headshot, not my this photo on Facebook. So I sent it to them. 
And I found like later that day that they used my face for the event page. So <laughs> I had to email them and go, actually, no, I'm not comfortable being the face of the event. If you want my headshot in the series of other artists, happy to share that, but I don't feel comfortable with my likeness being the event. And they were very understanding, but I think the takeaway from that was really specific language around what you're using that for, context. Um, Cause yeah, that's, it was a very awkward situation to be in. <laughs> And and yeah, wow, certainly. <laughs> I'm sorry that happened. It's okay. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Um. Uh, and and I would like to stress that that the specificity in language and usage um uh should be on the producers, not not on the individual artists to ask. Uh, it's our responsibility as engagers to do that. And um, I think like Stephanie pointed out, uh, when people are making requests, um, of course saying the context and the expectations, we're gonna put this picture up, it's gonna be up for this length of time. This is the context around it and this is why we're using it. Um, but I'd also, um, I, I think that one of the things that uh, I, I ended up doing a couple of, uh, for a couple of colleagues is, is offering to speak on their behalf when individual artists are saying, why is, my, why is a picture from my piece seven years ago on your website suddenly again? Um, and I don't feel like I have much agency in asking or demanding they take it down. Um, offering to ask as, act as advocates for each other and to write um, a stern dramaturgy email to someone and say uh, to to as a uh, as uh, to clarify what is happening. Um, oh, it looks like there's a uh, and Martha just mentioned that this issue arose in conversation with our dance artists as well. Yes, uh, a I I these experiences didn't happen to me, but a couple of colleagues in dance reported the same thing. Um, and perhaps I put it to the larger group like what do we have what what rights do we have to our faces and to our previous works that happened uh with a company with other presenters um uh pre-pandemic there i can move to the next question or if somebody wants to pipe up from our attendees i i appreciate uh hearing these experiences and sharing them um, I might ask mm, Derek's, sorry. I was just going to say that, um, in the next slide, we, we have some language around name and likeness. And again, I just, you know, um, want to point out, uh, that, and this would be a question really having looked at, uh, the contract that, um, Jiv and Rumble Theater are using, which is really interesting because I, I'm a huge advocate for plain English um, agreements and these provisions are anything but, right? So I do think actually when you are presented with a contract with language that you don't understand uh, or is de almost deliberately um, excessive for the circumstances, that's your first red flag. And if it's coming to you from a like-minded company, as clearly the previous example was, then um, treat it as they're like me. They actually are trying to figure this out too. I should, let's see if having a conversation can help. And maybe the way that Jiv um, and Rumble are proposing that, or the way that contract is drafted is open-ended enough um, my concern would be around making sure that rights are somehow addressed. You don't necessarily need them um, to be like this, but I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the imagery that is created around the work is also a part of um, what you're either being paid for or not being paid for. And you want to make sure that you have some something in there that that if you if it matters to you that you'll at least be spoken to um communicated with in the event that 
um, they want to use your name and likeness. So like the example Stephanie gave of tell me what it's for and then I can agree. Um, and those things don't, you don't need a long drawn out provision like this, which is out of a film agreement um, that I was just looking at. So it was, it was easy to get to. It's more just, you know, if you expect me to do promotion, there's, that's time and energy. If you're going to use my face, make sure that it links to my website, particularly if you're a freelance artist. Um, and that it's only for this production. It's not for any other use. Um, the, the one thing that came up in the, in the film context was actually where film artists, where dance artists were being, their imagery was being used to, for a festival they weren't even in. And that just seemed like weird that they would be the face of a festival that they're not in. Um, and it actually turned out that the photographer who took the photograph licensed the work to the festival. Um, so the dance artist, or so this is more germane for performers actually, um, found that, and Stephanie's example, you know, you become the face of the production without necessarily wishing to be or where it's inappropriate. Maybe that's a good um, bridge into at telling us some specific language to look for as a red flag or specific language that we can suggest in as independent artists um, or as as creators submitting our work right well um we did create a template agreement for the um the uh pivoting to digital series that looks at that has both a you know a single page for an artist to set out you know here's what i'm going to do here's uh, and it's mostly for music, but I think it, it actually isn't that difficult to apply it to, to other contexts. Um, and then it has some boilerplate language, you might say some term, the basic terms and conditions under which um, artists are, are, are working. So, you know, the producer's gonna do this or the presenter's gonna provide that. The, um, and there's other language attached. It's fairly plain English, but the difficulty with the, those kinds of agreements and using templates always is that once you get a lawyer in the frame, you tend to add more language than perhaps you want. So it is gonna be very dependent on the circumstances. One of the reasons that the artist legal outreach exists is so that when you get these contracts, you can actually review them with a lawyer if you need to. And um, I, but I, I also like the idea very much of perhaps doing some training around negotiation, perhaps for, for groups that could act. And I hate to give work to people who are already over capacity, but um, thinking about the GVPTA or another, you know, as other entities where, you know, like the dealing with disputes or addressing complaints, which are coming up more and more around conduct and respectful workplaces to be, use a euphemism, is, you know, could we train, get a group of trainers, uh, train the trainers to manage some of this for artists. And then maybe what we do um, also, and I'd be happy to work with, um, be a good project for a summer student, um, perhaps with Rumble on how we might add language into the agreement um, on, with the principles espoused that they are working towards um, that 
um, at least as a jumping off point. I also want to say that it's really important that no matter how many times you don't be afraid to ask for what you want, number one. Number two, um, the language doesn't need to be super complicated. And remember, the vast majority of these situations rarely end up in, in litigation, number one, or disputes. And if there is a dispute, if there is a conflict, maybe what we really need to be talking about, and this is a conversation I know that GVPTA and fines and others are looking at is how can we resolve some of these conflicts so they don't go legal, they don't turn into these massive conflagrations um, and people can repair relationships. So I think there's lots of um, opportunities to, to, to work on this. And maybe that. Oh, apologies. We have a good. Uh question for that, um, Martha, from the chat. It's uh, how much would folks say this has to do with the sheer ignorance to understanding contracts um, that uh, that are actual, that we rely on those of us who have representation from unions like CAEA or ACTRA, but our actual engagement with the language is minimal. And I appreciate what you're saying about that a lot of us have come into our, um, not a lot of us have formal education in this. and perhaps to the panel, this, this question. Yeah, I was, I was going to say what you were talking about um, training, Martha. I think that in my experience of any kind of um, institution of arts training or performing arts training, that's, again, in my experience, not even a little bit of a part of what I learned to do. Um, to um, the comprehension of contracts, um, the negotiation of contracts, um, any part of dealing with contracts, because again, the as Jiv has pointed out, I think that these unions bear minimum of language, but a lot of us are not part of any unions and are having to, or if you're an indie company, you're not always creating with these um, union contracts. So developing this language or understanding this language, because it seems like a lot of these examples that have been come up might have just been a misunderstanding or a lack of comprehension about what they were putting into their contractual agreements. So. Yeah. Training would be really fantastic, I think, both from a producing perspective, but also from a freelance artist perspective, because I don't think it's covered in, yeah, so again, my experience, but was not part of my training. Yeah, a negotiation 101, mm -hmm. I, I think. I mean, I've often thought of that. You know, I think the first thing is to demystify the contracts. And the reality is, is that in the examples that we're showing, with the exception of this last one here, but in the example at the beginning and the example of the company um, that shall remain nameless, that um, in both cases, I don't, they never got legal advice. They really didn't know what they were doing. And when I, I, you know, this is the same in, you know, I remember having a contract with Crazy Eights, the film, uh, eight minute films or whatever it was. And um, they had a boilerplate, which was straight out of the production manual at the time. And the writer wanted to reserve theatrical rights because he writes for theater. And um, it, it and the producers of at the time, this is 15 years ago now, um, had no idea how to do that. They didn't think they could because it was such a standardized agreement. And they ended up going to the guy who actually wrote the agreement, Arthur Evansel, who's a very well-known senior film uh, uh, entertainment lawyer um, in town. He, he just laughed. He, he and I were on the phone. It was like, this is not a problem. So it's, um, but how do you get that when really everybody just goes to the interwebs and finds stuff, right? Um, and I suspect in the case of um, in the in this in the case of um, the the theater with the submission piece that I, they just didn't realize what they were doing. And God forbid, please don't rely on a lawyer on your board whose practice is not really connected 
to this area because 90% of them will produce a film agreement because that, those are the ones that are easy to find on the interwebs. And suddenly you end up with the worldwide in perpetuity, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, I can be kind of flippant about all this, but um, I, I do like, I think in the fall, we could probably put something together that would be a, a negotiation 101. What would be fun to do would be to do it, um, you know, maybe as a part of a conference and do it experientially and then um, see if we can't glean from that uh, some pieces of it that would work well um, for use for others, you know, but this is part of the intention of the ex our clinic expanding it's these are one of the where areas we could do that if i may add i think that it's it's really fascinating that we're um we're seeing that a lot of theaters are looking to film standards to model their contracts after but theater a is not film but digital theater is also not film we are in a very unique subsection of art creation and also every project is unique there's no i think this is where the copy paste thing becomes really problematic because we can't copy paste any model because production to production is going to look very different it's treating each new circumstance as a new circumstance and i think that having that context for crafting contracts or negotiating contracts is really useful yeah, I agree with that. And uh, Kelly uh, Barker also mentioned that in the chat um, about uh, it, it's it's hard to foresee what's going to happen, uh, like what's going to happen down the road. The projects might change and, and try to capture all the possibilities. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, some kind of training would be great. And also, um, I I also didn't have that training back at uh, SFU when I was there, but I know that. Uh, I think there is a um, cultural entrepreneurship class uh, at SFU, at least last semester. Um, Kenji might know more about that uh, for next semesters, uh, but yes. We have a really good question in the Q&A. Uh, Stephanie Co writes, in live theater and music, fair compensation is often based on time or hours. How is that shifted in our opinion with the digital pivot, where for example, an artist can record a rehearsal or performance or instructive segment once, and it can be reused multiple times. And I'll say that this happened to me. I recorded a workshop, a writing workshop for an organization, and then it was shared to another organization with my permission, but then that organization kept sharing it. Um, uh, and perhaps some, I, I'm, I'm going to just add to Stephanie's question that um, some things that we make, we are not thinking that they're going to be current forever. There's no way you could make a workshop that could be current forever. So, um, and I didn't, it, how do we, how do we even figure how, what that compensation could be? I don't have a great answer for this, um, but I guess part of it is the monetization of how it is being shared or used further. It's, I mean, that's just my question around that. Like, is it being monetized moving forward? Um, oftentimes I don't imagine it is, um, but it still doesn't mean that the artist is being equitably compensated for their involvement with the project. Yeah, and I'll even jump on that. Like, and not all compensation is, financial like i understand that somebody they're not like making uh hundreds of dollars <laughs> if that, off of that but uh but is it how is it credited how is it contextualized what is the frame around it yeah, yeah. and kelly mm -hmm. one of the things that came up um it when we in the conversation about music was the musicians that realized they could create their own um uh online music school <laughs> and that's what they ended up doing um 
and I'm blanking on the name, um, though it might come back to me at three o'clock in the morning as these things do. Uh, and, um, but having been asked repeatedly to do this, she, they realized that actually this is something they could do themselves better and create a, um, a opportunity for other musicians to control, if you will, the means of production. And I think that some of these platforms um, are like, that's what I think more and more people are realizing. It's a little bit, you know, is that if it's on a dedicated platform, you know, if you had a, sorry, Kenji, if you had a GBPTA platform that was going to be the repository for the stuff, then it would be controlled by the artists themselves. And that's also the hope of, you know, there's a, there's a um, delivery app uh, that was created by local restaurants um, to serve local restaurants so that DoorDash and Skip the Dishes, et cetera, um, are not the people getting the money um, and that it wasn't so usurious. I mean, 30% off the top, there goes your margin, bye-bye. Um, and, and I think, you know, I really like the ethics that is, con that are contained in the example of the, the, that Rumble circulated, because it really speaks to what I hear all the time from all of you, which is, it's the community that matters, it's representation that matters, it's goodwill, it's relationships, so, sorry, I meant relationship, not representation, though representation is also important. Um, and, and that's what governs the work that you do. Um, and, you know, you, what you don't need is having foisted upon you a bunch of language that really doesn't help. In fact, it hinders um, often. Um, only when the money is so significant that you can afford to go, I'm not going to worry about it, or that's why I have an agent, or, you know, as, as Getty Lee says, I don't worry about copyright, I'm very well paid, thank you very much, um, uh, which I thought was a very apt comment. Um, this is many years ago now, but he, he didn't get involved in arguments about it because he just felt that it was not his place to, um, and he made the point that for independent artists, it's a whole different ball game because when you do, you know, like the instructional uh, workshop that you were talking about, Joanna, when you take that and then it goes and somebody uses it without even considering the implications, um, that's a problem. And it, and it's never, it's rarely, not never, but it's rarely about the money. It's like, how am I going to make a living if all this stuff just gets perpetually recorded and put out there. But that's why, like when we started and, and we looked at the language, the license language from that submission, it's terrible. That's why don't sign those and make an appointment with the artist legal outreach if you need to, if you ever want to talk it over with someone. Um, so we have like two minutes left and Valerie mentions the Carfax standard in the chat. And Jiv mentions engaging with the ethics of these larger corporate entities in the chat. And perhaps our non Getty Lee panelists, Derek and Stephanie might have a, a, a closing or, um, uh, well, obviously this conversation has to be ongoing, so. Yeah, Jiv, um, I, I, as you know, like back at Resin Beans, we had uh, the um, uh, Made in Canada, Pedro's Pete's, uh, the the agricultural operetta, and and you know we had to go through Spotify and Apple Music and all that because because that has the biggest reach uh, because it gave us the best analytics and and yeah I don't I don't know how to navigate it because we we tried Bandcamp uh, which is relatively a little better but it just it doesn't do the same thing um, and yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think we are definitely dealing with um, the challenges of 
suddenly having access to really great distribution, but also the complexities of what does that mean to have, I, I don't know, great power, great responsibility, that kind of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> That's my great closing remark. <laughs> well, I think um, that's actually a good place to to um, to to close this. Um, it, uh, it's inevitable when you only have an hour, things start to 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 gel a bit. But I think the purpose of these is really to get a to get a sense of what works, what doesn't, and for us as Clio um, to. Uh, who are dedicated to supporting the sector to figure out ways that we can really support the sector. Um, and we did that by creating a contract because we were being asked for one. Um, but, you know, I think your your comments, um, Jib and Valerie, and we'll, we'll keep, uh, we have, we'll keep that um, because we can with this technology. Um, give us some really good ideas for planning for the fall. And if any of you have any projects where I always like to use, um, you know, examples uh, when I put together these kinds of things, I think it'd be great to you be able to do that. So um, thank you, Joanna and Derek and Stephanie for giving us so much of your uh, time and energy. Uh, thanks again to the GVPTA uh, and PUSH for helping us get uh, the word out to the community. Um, and thanks to our ASL interpreters and Martha Nelson, our new uh, Director of Communications uh, for all her help. And uh, for all of you who came because we do this for you and uh, as part of our work and look forward to continuing to serve you. So have a great day, everybody. It's not really raining, so go out and enjoy it. Thank you, Martha. Thank you.